Lewis Clark. Um, he's an Armour resident, uh, born and raised on the Niagara Reservation in Wisconsin. He's got a unique blend of poetry and storytelling, um, which is uh, part of the oral tradition of his people. In 2011, the Sequoia National Research Center, along with the University of Arkansas, published a collection of his poetry titled Two Shoes that's available for sale out in the lobby, as well as his newest book, How to Be an Indian in the 21st Century. That was just released by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. They were being very good to him, sending him to conferences and PR. He has a handler. Um, him and his wife, a uh, tradition looking ahead seven generations, have raised six children from all over their college degrees. I've met several of them. It's just a wonderful family. Lewis is a really cool person. Um, and he's going to get us started today. Um, so kick us off, Lewis. Thank you, Nicole. A lifetime ago, I jotted down those words in a notebook, and I still have the notebook. But the proud, maybe arrogant young man, stubborn and persistent, has disappeared, except for maybe my sense of humor. Um, today, like the most of you, I wear the mantle of the name writer, humbly upon my shoulders. The great things that are happening, I've come to see, bring a great responsibility. For I've come to understand that you and I, with our words, we can change the world, or at least a little part of it. Hello. I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone who is part of this Lake Fly Literary Conference, and I want to extend my welcome to all the participants. Thank you and welcome. I believe that it was only about five years ago, maybe a little more, when a group of people, Ruth, Tom, Dixie, Joyce, Pat, Paul, and me as, as an observer, met in this little room over at the library and brainstormed what has now become this wonderful conference. I take no credit for any of it, I was just taking along. I call it a place where dreams are nourished and dreams can grow. Dreams are so important because before things become a reality, we have to be able to dream. Dreams are so important be Dreams are so important because they become a reality. Before they become a reality, we have to be able to dream them. Like Ruth said, my name is Lewis Clark, Lewis Vincent Damien Clark III. That's a lot of name to hang on a kid. Some people call me Two Shoes. I was born and raised on the Oneida Reservation. I am of two worlds. My father's people were from Europe, and my mother's people were here waiting for them. Um, in 1834, 700 and plus of us moved from New York to Wisconsin. In 1849, ah, in 1849, Five of the first 38 students at Lawrence University of Appleton were Oneida tribal members. My family, my people are steeped in dreams. I want to take you on a journey to a long time ago. Maybe it was a memory, maybe it was a dream. I can see myself walking around the baseball diamond in Oneida, a stone's throw from Holy Apostles Church. I see surrounding the outfield tents and teepees logs for sitting and campfires. By home plate, I can see and I can hear the drums. Not the white man drums that you hear on television. Boom, 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 boom. The drums I heard was a steady beat. Boom, 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 boom. The heartbeat of my nation. Hearing those drums made a little boy sleeping in his bed feel secure. So I wrote the poem, Fourth of July in Oneida. Off in the distance, in my memory, I hear the drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. I started writing poetry in the sixth grade after being exposed to, by Sister Jean Patrice, the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, that made a big difference in my life. Um, and at the same time, from the radio, a song about dreams, The Quest from the Man of La Mancha. To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to try when your arms are too weary, to run where the brave dare not go. There was poetry in the air on the reservation. It whispered to me from the willows. It played within the pines. But sixth grade boys who write poetry, who write songs, they get teased and they get beat up a lot. 
When I was young, I didn't know that I was an Indian. My friends didn't know that they were Indians. We just were, we were people. I wrote a poem about how a lot of us learned that we were Indians. It's called First Grade Lessons. I was flat on my back getting hit in the face when a young man informed me what was my race. I was bleeding and crying, but I couldn't agree. I didn't look like anything I saw on TV. I didn't have a pony, only had a cat. Daddy didn't wear a loincloth, thank God for that. Um, speaking of my daddy and my mom, they had dreams also. Mom rented herself out as a live-in domestic so that she could attend high school. During World War II, she won a poster contest where Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, came to award the prize. She played baseball all over the Midwest, perhaps planting the seeds that make me a World Series champion Chicago Cubs fan. After 108 years, you have to beg my indulgence. <laughs> Dad fought in World War II and Korea. After he died, we came to discover through his war records that he was actually awarded the Bronze Star. He never told anybody. These two people had dreams, but the end of the World War II pushed a woman to the back of the bus, and the nightmares of the war had to be dealt with. Add some alcohol into the mix, a heavy dose of the 1960s, and we arrived at the poem called Closed Eyes. When my mama beat my daddy, and my daddy beat my mom, the sun kept right on shining. No one said that it was wrong. No one said that it was wrong. Those words haunted me, but I survived. I had dreams. Being bussed off the reservation to go to high school, I was going to be the greatest football player to come off the reservation since Jim Thorpe. Freshman football, one night I was brought up to play defensive back at practice on the junior varsity field. I jumped my receiver's route, intercepted the pass, broke through the line, head for a touchdown. I was on my way. In the locker room, all the freshmen were congratulating me when an upperclassman, offensive lineman, seven foot tall, 300 pounds, flaming red hair came up to me. I had made the big time. I was ready to get a high five. He said, take my shoes off. I said, what? Then he high-fived my face. My dreams of football disappeared, and it got worse. I had to ride the bus. A 110-pound freshman, when another upperclassman decided to give me special attention each night, I wrote this poem, Red Muse. You're in my seat, he said to me. I looked around. I could see plenty of seats on that old bus where we could sit, the two of us. You're in my seat, he said to me, then slapped my head repeatedly till tears were streaming down my face. Swallowing my pride, I moved my place. This went on night after night until I stood up for myself. I hit him, and he didn't move. The bus driver tackled me, held me down, so five years later I married her niece. <laughs> this is when dreams really began. I saw a young lady, brown hair, funky glasses, sweet smile, blue blouse, blue skirt, high heels. She's sitting out front. So I asked her to go out with me. She said no. So I kept asking. She kept saying no. I thought she's beautiful and she's smart. But along with dreaming, I was persistent. Then her mother and her older sister made her go out with me. And on Friday the 13th, January 13th, 1973, we had our first date. It was like meeting in a revolving door at the library. We've been going around ever since. I wanted to be a cowboy, breaking horses, riding the range. Not much call for that in Wisconsin. Plus, I was an Indian, so you have that Ben Dick Darnold thing working there. My wife and I, we put our heads together, and after being married for four years, being blessed with two children, we looked at our history then forwards at what we want for our family. Our tradition calls it looking ahead seven generations. We left the reservation, came to Oshkosh in search of our dream. With education as our foundation, we were ignorant of the barriers of life. And I hope to always be ignorant of the barriers of life. We were stubborn, we were persistent, and I'm honored to say that after nearly 40 years, our children, our six children, have all earned their college degrees, and I too, after 25 years of night school, I earned my degree. The dream was to be a poet, 
My first year here, I wrote a play, mostly dialogue, but interspersed with poetry. The, the theater professor didn't think too much of my play. My Shakespeare professor said my term paper was the worst he'd ever seen, and still I got a B on it. My poetry professor was chagrined at the use of the rhyming word. However, I had my first poem published nationally. The dream was still alive. But like for many of us, life gets in the way. Sometimes you have to set aside your dreams to help fulfill the dreams of others. When you bring children into this world, they are the dream, and you are the dream maker. I didn't like baseball as a kid. I couldn't run, couldn't catch, couldn't hit, but I could throw. And that ability, those abilities or lack thereof, may have planted the seeds. In 1965, Charlie Hill, who later became one of the, if not the greatest Indian comic of our time. At 13 years old, he was considered by family and friends to be quite the athlete. He was helping to coach the Little League team, the Rangers, and now the Rangers had a right fielder playing deep, 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 deep right field. And uh, I played deep right field, contemplating butterflies and dandelions, which is good foundational work for a would-be poet. For some reason, coach had me pitch to Charlie. Five pitches later, Charlie struck out swinging. The course of his destiny forever altered. He gave up baseball and turned to comedy. One of his sketches involved the turmoil between the Lone Ranger and Tonto. The Lone Ranger says, Tonto, we're in big trouble now. We're surrounded by Indians. To which Tonto replies, what you mean we, white man? Sherman Alexi, the leading Indian author of our time, took that concept and produced his first novel, The Lone Ranger and Tonto Fist Fight in Heaven. Just think, two great careers may be traced back to this arm. I really never cared for baseball, but in 1982 we installed cable television and my kids fell in love with baseball, their dreams. So in 1988 I became a Little League baseball coach. I drafted my wife into being our, back, our dugout coach and bookkeeper. The kids called her Coach Honey. I coached Little League for 19 years. I wrote this poem, Little League Pitcher. Here's the last verse. I'm the greatest Little League pitcher, of that there is no doubt. Whenever I walk out on the field, my family stands to shout. They think it's really pretty cool, they think it's kind of nifty to see their dad in Little League, although he's over 60. I wanted my kids to dream, and I worked on my dreams, but I kept get, putting them in my pocket. People kept telling me, or I kept hearing, that no one wanted to read the type of poems that I wrote. I went to a gathering of poets in Green Bay, a week-long session in poetry. I saw and learned a lot of things. But it really wasn't quite me. A renowned poet, who shall rename, remain nameless, came to Oshkosh to give a poetry class. I signed up and was instructed to bring, one poem, to bring a poem along to share. My advice to all who poets out there, always bring two poems. The poet much, much recognized gave his lecture with the main emphasis being never, I repeat, never repeat a word or phrase more than three times in a row. I sunk a bit lower in my chair, like when I was in grade school and didn't want to be called on. Mr. Clark, the teacher said, would you like to read us your poem? I attempted to beg off when he said, Mr. Clark, read us your poem. I hurt, I hurt, I hurt, I hurt. From my head down to my toes, exercising with my wife, my survival no one knows. She feeds me green and red and yellow, even purple on my plate. These aren't the colors of real food, a truth I'd like to state. Bread and gravy and french fries too, real food is brown. I'd look inside the refrigerator, that's one color never found. I repeated the phrase four times. I didn't think the poem would work without the fourth I hurt. The teacher, well, I wasn't teacher's pet. I was told that no one wanted to read the type of poems that I wrote. Maybe not in so many words, but I got the drift. You can only bounce your head off a concrete wall so many times before you scream, ouch. But if you really have the dream, you say, that wall don't look so tough. I had a great life. I had a great wife, good family. I decided to keep writing. But I was going to ignore the rules and only write what sounded good to me or whatever God put in my head. 
I was in Minnesota at a Viking stadium watching one of my four sons who pitched baseball for Lawrence University. I found this line playing in my head, so with my daughter-in-law being a Viking fan and my wife being a Brent Favre fan, even after he went to the Vikings, I wrote this poem called Big Black Dog. I'll read the pertinent part. It's not that I have the greatest pride as I hear his paws and toenails slide across the asphalt all out of control. I fall like a Viking at the Super Bowl. I decided to put my poetry to practical use. There may have been some racial inequities in the workforce over the years. On a Tuesday, there was a test for a promotion at work. On Wednesday, they threw that test out without revealing the succor and decided to interview two of us. One gentleman who happened to have the same last name as one of the bosses and me. Um, the gentleman after yelling at me about being an Indian, well, he got the promotion. A year later, another test. We asked for the scores and I had the highest score. So the, so the company awarded the job by seniority. Why well, have a test? Another year later, I had the highest test and the highest seniority. They asked me to turn down the job so they could award it to someone else who happened to have the same last name as another boss. <clears throat> Thank the Lord for the union. I received the promotion. The dilemma. The crew could make me or break me. I decided to share my poetry. This was with an excavating crew. Truck drivers and heavy equipment operators, and it worked. I believe that everyone would like to, have, to be remembered for what they do. We, the crew and I, would make many time capsules of my poems, listing all of our names and what we did on the job, then placing them in a plastic container and attaching them to each cross collar that we installed. One season we installed over 100 driveway culverts and 50 cross culverts. A lot of poems, epic poems like Ode to a Peanut Cluster or Cell Phone Talkers, or with apologies to Shel Silverstein, a foreman named Lou. Well, my daddy left home when I was 10, he didn't leave much to this, this shovel and then, an allergy to school that really made you itch. He said if you don't study hard, you may end up looking like a ton of lard, and the only job you'll find is digging a ditch. And that's what I did. We plowed the snow in the winter, so I wrote a salute to Bruce Springsteen. In the day, we sweated out in the fields, putting up the snow fence rolls. At night, we wait by the telephone, telling us it's going to snow, because tramps like us, baby, we were born to plow. Um, then one evening, I was reading the newspaper. It was like the night before deer hunting season, and uh, my name on the reservation because of my deer hunting prow prowess is Damn It Missed Again. Anyway, there was a small ad calling for poets to submit samples, five samples, so I did. Soon I received an email asking for five more poems, and they didn't ask for money, so I sent five more poems. Then they requested 35 to 40 poems and still no request for money. So after some two-finger typing, I sent the poems in, capital T, then a phone call. A Mr. James Perrins, head of the English department at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, representing the Sequoia National Research Center, wanted to know if I'd allow them to publish a chapbook for me. I said, what's the catch? He said, the catch is that you now have to go out and share your poetry with the world. Show the book. Oh, okay, show the book, Louie. Here's the book. It's called Two Shoes. And believe it or not, it's been quite successful. Um, they printed a thousand copies and they disappeared, just like that. We are getting more copies and for some reason people seem to enjoy the poetry. I started doing small one and two poem readings. My first was, was in Appleton. There was a vast array of poets there. I was scared. There were long hairs, there were short hairs, there were no hairs, there were cowboys, there was, I was the Indian, there were hippies, there were straights, there was a woman who dreamed of killing her husband and wrote about it. I was really scared. I read two poems, then Ellen Court, the poet laureate of Wisconsin, came up and said she liked my work. Then I joined the Oshkosh Writers Club, a place to go and nurture your dreams. I was doing what I enjoyed, writing poetry and sharing poetry, when, capital W, when one grand morning I was performing my duties at Carleton the Doorman at the Lake Fly Literary Conference. I had been assigned other duties over the years, but eventually the powers that decided, 
the powers that be decide to save the donuts and award me the doorman duties when, another capital W, when Ruth came rushing in. Away to the window she flew like a flash with the phone to her ear. The color drained from her face and her hair doing the best Don King imitation I ever saw. Straight up. Well, right away I knew something was wrong and I said, what's wrong? She looked at me and my blood ran cold. If I was playing cards, that hand I'd pull. Can you talk for an hour, she said. I heard the 1812 overture explode from the walls, cannons and all. Ruth staggered back. The Hans Zimmerman number 10 finale sounded out. You know, a theme from the Lone Ranger, high old silver, dum 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 And I smiled and said, yes, I can. And it began. I was soon doing our speeches. And I was asked to go to Madison to testify at a mascot hearing, which led to my greatest speech of all time in Berlin, Wisconsin, for some kids who were going to work on a reservation out west. Those kids kept me talking for two and a half hours. And then, capital T, one of the mothers called and asked me to give a speech at Stevens Point. Free food. And what is the name of your speech, she said. I blurted out, how to be an Indian in the 21st century? And then another capital T. Someone from the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets was in the audience and invited me to give a speech at their annual conference. So I did. And then someone from the audience said, you should put your speech into a book. <laughs> but while all of this was going on, one of my workers got Paul Horning's autograph for me. Uh, Paul Horning, he's the Aaron Rodgers of my childhood. So I wrote Mr. Horning a thank you note, and then one day the crew and I, I can carry six in my truck, were headed out to a job on County Highway K when my cell phone rang and it was Paul Horning. I didn't believe it, but we talked and he said, I should write the book about the 1960 Green Bay Packers. Right there in the middle of the road, I stopped the truck and I did the happy dance. And then I wrote the Packer book. I did the research and sent a copy of the finished product to New York Little Field Press. Seventy-four thousand words. Uh, it said response time was two to four months. Four days later, I got a call from the editor saying he liked the book and wanted to double the words because it was only thirty-five thousand at the time. They also suggested that I interview Packer players for their memories. I didn't want to use interviews because I feel memories aren't always specific to the time. I used magazine articles and newspapers to make sure that the stories were fact-based. I did reach out to the surviving Packers and Jim Taylor sent me a nice letter and Bart Starr's office called. Then I was able to be part of a group discussion concerning the 1960 Green Bay Packers, specifically David Moranis, um, well specifically Vince Lombardi, but David Moranis, the author of When Pride Still Mattered, and Obama, first in his class, Bill Clinton, um, he was there, he headed the discussion, and uh, Eric Simonson, who wrote Lombardi, the Broadway play, was the two of them headed it. The two of them start off by taking us back to 1964, where they said Horning began the season in a rut. Paul Horning is my hero. I objected, citing that the Packers, led by Horning, had defeated the world's champion Chicago Bears with Horning kicking three field goals, one of 52 yards, the longest of his career, and the Packers won 23 to 12 in the opening game of the season. By the end of the week-long discussion, Moranis and Simonson had dubbed me the Packer expert, so I went with my instincts on the book. My editor at Littlefield Press liked the book, but the publisher turned down because so many 1960 Packers had done books recently. During the speech, during a speech at the Kiwanis Club in Amro, they recommend that I send both books to the Wisconsin Historical Society. So I did. I was involved, invited down to Madison to meet with the people at the Historical Society. I met Kathy, the boss, and Kate, the editor. They sat my wife and I down and said they liked my writing, but they just published two Green Bay Packer books and probably didn't want to do that again. Then Kate said, and we don't even accept submissions of the kind of book that How to Be an Indian in the 21st Century is. I was shocked to say the least. 
My eyes started twitching. I looked like that Italian guy who played the Keep America Beautiful Indian on TV with one tear streaming down my cheek. And then Kate said the magic word, but my world pivoted on that word. Your book is different. We can hear your voice and we'd like to publish it. And here it is. Um, How to be an Indian in the 21st century. Our book launch was March 23rd. It was a dark stormy night in Madison and yet every seat was full. Sold a lot of books. I think Kathy, the publisher, was pleased. A week later, another book launch at my home library, Amro, standing room only, and more books disappeared. Then the publisher took my wife and I to Minnesota, put us up in a fancy hotel, 23rd floor. I was one of 20 small publishing house authors invited to a booksellers convention. I signed about 100 books. Then a few weeks ago, I received a call and the lady said, we just purchased 200 of your books. What would you charge us to come and sign them? I said, I'd be happy with gas money. They put us up at a hotel, meals, and when I opened the envelope with a check, it said a lot of gas money. Um, it, I believe, was truly a gift from above. It paid for me to incorporate Two Shoes LLC, because our, our, the publisher took me to an accountant and said that's what he had said I should do. And I ordered a box of books, which are for sale out front. Um, I, t I trace a lot of this back to the Lake Fly Literary Conference and Ruth doing her Don King imitation. Thank you, Ruth and Tom and Dixie and Pat and Joyce and Paul. I hope that you see, I hope that I've shown you, success is about being yourself. Your voice, write, or whatever you do, do it for you. Make yourself an honorable person. person. Show who you are, your uniqueness. I just read a quote, be like a stamp, stick to it until you arrive where you want to go. I'd like to say that my poetry teacher, Doug Flaherty, is in the audience. Thank you for coming, Doug. Um, I'd like to end with a quote from How to Be an Indian in the 21st Century. In the long run, people will give you what you expect of them. Expect their best. So welcome to the Lake Fly Literary Conference where miracles can happen and dreams do come true. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to be on Author Showcase, please contact us on our Facebook page or at oshkoshauthorshowcase at gmail.com. Otherwise, continue the conversation with Dixie and Tom via social media. Look for Dixie by searching for Daisy Jericho, and please check out her books, The Love Thief and Sparks Fly on Amazon. You can find Tom Cannon on many types of social media, and please check out his book on Amazon, The Tower of Apathy. Our goal is to introduce local authors around Oshkosh and hear their stories. We want to thank the Oshkosh Public Library and the Friends of Oshkosh Public Library for supporting the creation of this show. If you are a writer and are looking for a community, we suggest the Oshkosh Area Writers Club and the Lakefly Writers Conference held each May.